Welcome back to uh, CST 100 overview of the Bible as we continue our video lectures. It's good to be with you. Uh, let me again make myself available to you if there's any way that I can help you and uh, anything I can do not only in this course but personally or in your walk with Christ or questions you may have. Just want to make sure you know I'm available for you and uh, you have all my good contact information there on the syllabus, so don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Uh, but specifically in regards to the course, I am grateful for the opportunity to facilitate you through this uh, learning as we look at the overview of the Bible. And today we will continue looking at the um, epistles that Paul wrote, the Pauline epistles part two, as uh, this is the second lecture for uh, week six in your course. So let's get started and get right into it. Uh, we'll begin here with the letter to the Philippians. Again, these are letters to churches. A little bit later on, we'll see a distinction in Paul's letters to uh, Timothy and Titus and Philemon as individuals. But here, Paul's writing to churches, um, as we mentioned before, the Roman church, the Corinthian church, the Galatian church, the Ephesian church, and here, uh, the church in Philippi. Um, the uh, the letter to the Philippians or the Philippian church. And so uh, as we see this, uh, the letter that Paul wrote to them, again, the introductory, introductory material is that Paul um, clearly introduces himself and, and uh, the date is probably early, very early 60s AD. And um, we know this is one of the prison epistles. Paul was writing from a captivity in which he was in and uh, quite possibly when he was in arrest on, in Rome. And so uh, the key themes are the unity of the church, um, humility, sanctification, um, standing firm against the opponents of the gospel. Here some 2,000 years later, we still see the gospel um, with harsh opposition in the world in which we live, just as it was in the first century. And then a key theme in um, all of Paul's writing, or a key theme through a lot of Paul's specific writing, is this idea of suffering, that, that um, as we live for Christ, we join in his sufferings, and so we are to rejoice in the fact that we're suffering uh, for Christ, just as Christ suffered. It's not suffering for suffering's sake. It's not suffering um, just so we're somehow punished or done wrong but rather it's a suffering that allows us to um, not only unite in the fellowship with Christ and his suffering, um, but also to grow and to learn and to realize the humility and the surrender that we need to have before God, just as Christ humbly surrendered himself by suffering uh, in submission to the cross. And so uh, we see these themes laid out and, and the outline here, Paul's greeting and thanksgiving, and prayer for uh, the church. And Paul presents his current circumstances and his attitude as a result of it, which is one of joy, even as the gospel is going forward in his encouragement, um, even to these believers. Um, he shares practical instructions in sanctification, sanctification being that life of following Christ as we grow and as we mature. And so realizing that even though we're still living here, we can live in the boldness of our assurance because this earth is not our home. We're citizens of heaven. If you remember in 2 Corinthians 5, the theme of being ambassadors. Ambassadors are one who their home is one place, but they're sent someone else, sent somewhere else to be a representative. And so we're, our citizenship is in heaven, but we're living boldly here um, for proclamation of the gospel. And we're also living humbly because as Christ was a servant, we too are servants. And so we um, live in humility, realizing that even the grace that God's granted to us, we certainly do not deserve. But we also live obediently as children of God because of that grace, our life in response to what God's done for us is to live a life that's obedient and pleasing to him. And then we see these examples of humble servants um, in Timothy and in Epaphroditus, um, as Paul references them specifically. And then Paul deals with some doctrinal issues. Um, 
the fact that the Judaizers uh, boast in the flesh, um, but Paul's goal is to share in the resurrection, which for Christ to be resurrected, he had to be crucified and put to death. And thus we see that aspect of suffering taking place there. Um, but in the perfection and in the humility that we're moving forward in Christ and that Paul is an example of this conduct and watching and waiting as we look uh, towards Christ. And so um, here we see uh, not dealing with specific issues of Jew and Gentile um, like we saw in some of the other writings of Paul, but in Philippians here and as we'll see in Colossians as well, um, the the idea is that it's not the ethnic issue as much as it is the gospel itself. So that's what separates some of these letters, the letter to the Philippians, and in a moment what we'll talk about the, in the letter to the Colossians. Um, it's not, not dealing with the Jew and Gentile issue like the Romans and the Galatians and the Ephesians did. Um, the letter to the Colossians, again, as we just mentioned, both the letter to the Colossians and the letter to the Philippians deal um, more generally to these churches and don't deal with the distinction between Jew and Gentile. And so um, as introduction, again, uh, written by Paul, uh, probably around A.D. 60, and again, um, one of the prison uh, letters uh, that Paul wrote and quite possibly from his imprisonment in Rome. Uh, the key themes, that Christ is the Lord of creation and the new creation that comes as a result of being in Christ, um, the sufficiency of Christ for salvation and sanctification. Remember, sanctification being that life that we live as we're growing in our faith and then living as new creations in Christ. So um, as the Apostle Paul pointed out to the Corinthian church, in Christ we're new creatures. And so those are the key themes that are expressed here. Um, Paul opens with his salutation. Paul deals with orthodoxy, or basically what is correct or what is right, and the fact that it's the sufficiency of what Christ has done. Remember, our salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So Christ is all sufficient. And um, Paul, through thanksgiving and prayer for the church, um, exalts Christ as both the Lord and the Redeemer, the one who reconciles us to God, and that um, his very ministry and the commission that he follows in obedience to Christ con is concerning this mystery of Christ, that, that his past labors are aimed at perfection in Christ, but his present concern is regarding any who would defect or turn from Christ because even though it's not specifically identified in the book of Colossians, there was some outside teaching that seems to have been affecting this church that Paul was concerned um, that would cause them to look or be led away from something other than uh, salvation in Christ and the sufficiency that we have in Christ. So Christ is exalted as supreme over all that the world has to offer and, and the sufficiency that we have is in him. Um, also, the heterodoxy, the sufficiency of Christ, as we mentioned already, um, and that's restated by Paul, and that the Colossians practices um, as a denial of the sufficiency of Christ if they're turning to some other way of practice or something they feel like they have to do rather than completely and wholly trust in Christ alone. And this is a contradiction of their life in Christ. Um, because as they have died with Christ, they've died to human regulations um, because they're no longer of uh, self, but they've resurrected with Christ. And so they're seated above with Christ, where Christ is now seated in the heavenly places, um, as the apostle says in Colossians 3, verse 1. And then there's orthopraxy, which is the idea of correct practice. Um, in the way that we live our lives in Christ. And again, that the sufficiency of Christ is experienced um, individually as we live, where, where he uses the illustration of putting off the old man just like taking off clothes and putting on the new man just like putting on a brand new um, set of clothes so that we are different in the way that we live. And, and this is experienced in home relationships amongst the family and it's experienced in our relationship to others, not only other believers, 
but others in the world around us. And then we see Paul's, again, final greeting and um, the personal aspect of the letters that he's writing. Um, first and second Thessalonians. Uh, these, this was written to the church at Thessalonica. And um, the idea that, again, it seems that Paul was addressing some issues that were that he was questioned about. Um, and so Paul writes in response to this, again, Paul being the author, uh, one of his pastoral letters that was encouraging and addressing these issues and concerns that were reported to him by uh, Timothy, who was um, his, uh, his protege, one that he was mentoring in, in the ministry and in the faith, and, um, and that the purpose was to encourage them and express joy in their faith and to correct any misunderstandings about the end times or when Christ would return, as well as address some moral and practical issues that they were dealing with. So, so the, the, the primary focus here, the primary in regards to the themes um, of First Thessalonians, well, and Second, Second Thessalonians as well, is dealing with their ethical living as it relates to the truth of Christ's return, that, that, tru that, that truly Christ would return, and even though he hadn't as of this point, and some of them had questions about that, that their living in Christ was a witness and a testimony and a reminder to the truth that Christ would return. And so um, he talks about these last days, and um, the Thessalonians have these questions about Christ's return, and, and uh, Paul's love for them in light of their uncertainty is what motivates him in regards to these exhortations, these these just deep desires that are expressed that they would live um, and and live faithfully unto Christ until He returns or until they die, whichever might happen first. And so Paul gives clear instructions on how they ought to live in light of the return of Christ, and and specifically deals with it in the ish, area of sexual purity, um, brotherly love for one another. And knowledge and encourage and knowledge and encouragement about Christ's return in relation to again whether they die before He returns or whether they're still alive when He returns, um, and then also dealing with relational issues um, within the church. And so um, we see this uh, throughout the Apostle. Uh, excuse me, and that's a that's a repeat slide. So let me get rid of that slide. And um, so. We see this uh, through the uh, outline of uh, Colossians, and uh, then there's Second, excuse me, Thessalonians, and then there's Second Thessalonians. Apologize for those slides that were out of order there. Um, again, Paul writing to this same church, um, and uh, was probably in Corinth as he dealt with um, the issues that again he was talking about in regards to the second coming of Christ and standing firm until. Christ comes being found faithful and living right ethically in light of Christ coming again as a reminder, as a way that we can give testimony to the fact that Christ um, will return. And so we see that throughout 2 Thessalonians um, outlined here with not only his normal greeting, but as he comforts them and encourages them to persevere in the midst of the pers and persecution, the difficulties that they're going through, um, as well as this life being a preparation uh, for us as Christians, as saints, uh, for the kingdom of God, and um, correcting some misunderstanding in regards to the day of the Lord, that final judgment, Christ's return. And um, even though it's ahead, that uh, we are still living in obedience here and now as we are growing in our understanding. And then the reminder concerning that, yes, those who are in Christ do have a place uh, that's prepared for them. And then some final exhortations in regards to practical matters, uh, dealing with prayer and dealing with others in the church who may not be living or may have gone stale or idle um, because of their misunderstanding or um, lack of encouragement. So uh, the Apostle Paul dealing with this in regards to the Thessalonian church. Then we have the personal letters that Paul wrote to Timothy. He wrote two letters that we have recorded to Timothy, and then a letter to Titus, and then a letter to Philemon. The letters to Timothy 
and to Titus are called the pastoral epistles. These seems these seem to be clear in their writing that Paul was mentoring these men in ministry as pastors, as shepherds, as as caretakers, as overseers. And so um, first and second Timothy and uh, the letter to Titus are called the pastoral epistles, thus letters written to these um, who he is admonishing and encouraging and exhorting as pastors uh, among the church of God. So it's important, important that we understand that. So first and second Timothy, the two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, um, again, Paul being the author, probably written in the mid 60s. And uh, the occasion was to encourage and instruct Timothy, who Paul calls his true son in the faith. Again, that protege that he's mentoring up. And uh, he wanted to encourage and instruct Timothy and the churches to which Timothy would be ministering to oppose false teachers and to behave in a godly manner as part of the church of God. And, and that's spelled out in the themes that we see throughout Timothy, um, to labor, to work for sound doctrine, to so guard um, that which is true and right according to the gospel, and um, also to connect theology with practice that both our belief and our behavior line up so that our lives reveal what we say we believe and that church leaders uh, have to live lives that are shaped by the gospel and evidence of and evident of the gospel's impact. Um, not that church leaders are perfect, but that their lives would give evidence or give fruit of being shaped and controlled by the fact of the gospel. Um, that there be mutual honor and love and that that should characterize the relationships in the church, and that the gospel as a whole should direct us as we worship together, both in unity and in modesty and in submission and service to one another. Um, there's the opening salutation. Uh, there's the instructions on how to deal with, how to confront those who are false teachers. Um, there's instructions on conduct in the church, as we just talked about, both corporate prayer and the related issues. Um, church leadership, this is a key passage of scripture in regards to overseers or pastors or shepherds uh, within the church. Um, then application of Christian truth. And again, coming back around to identifying false teaching uh, in contrast to the truth of the gospel. Um, that our ministry should be shaped by the gospel. That we should be good servants, especially those who are leaders. Now, remember, he's talking to uh, those to whom he's raising up and training to be a pastor and a minister following in his footsteps, that we're to be good servants of Christ, that um, there are certain relationships by age and gender, um, care for and warning to certain widows, um, honor and discipline among the elders, the pastors, uh, proper relationships in, uh, in the world as well as, again, confronting false teachers in comparison to godly leaders, and then specific instructions to uh, those who are wealthy by this earthly means. And then, again, conclusions, final charge, and caution that's given. Uh, in Second Timothy, again, Paul's the author, written in probably the late 60s A.D., and it's Paul's final instructions to his son in the ministry and his encouragement to Timothy to keep sound doctrine and defend against false teaching. Christianity was so early that it was vital that it stay pure and that there be a purity remaining that we have today and even today amongst those who would call themselves Christians. Not all are Christians, but that we who live according to the Bible would maintain and and be entrusted with the truth of the gospel, that that's what we would stand for in, in defense against any false teaching. And so it's important that we understand that, just as Paul was encouraging uh, these early ministers of the faith. So he talks about discipleship, being an example and being a disciple-making uh, leader, as well as faithfulness and standing against false teaching and perseverance in the midst of persecution and uh, even hope in the face of death, as Paul uh, seemed to see his own life uh, probably shortly coming to an end. Um, the fact that there was this strong stand in the present 
of Timothy's internal and personal responsibility as a minister to maintain a fresh relationship with God, standing strong and externally responsible for proclaiming the truth and discipling and teaching others according to the truth that he had received and knowing that his in his life he's serving the church of Christ with a purpose and that his work would be consistent and would be distinguished by the truth of the word. And so standing strong uh, against apostasy, those who would maybe claim to be Christian but are turning against and and how Paul instructs him in regards to uh, these matters and relying and remembering not only the word of God, but what you've been taught in line with the truth and above all maintaining the gospel and being willing and ready and able at any time to both present and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see that throughout Second Timothy in, uh, in the outline that we see there. And then there's the letter to Titus. Um, Titus, again, one of the recipients of the pastoral epistles um, written by Paul and Paul instructing Titus on the need for leadership and order in um, the church that uh, was planted and on the island of Crete, um, where Titus was left to, uh, to minister there. Um, he lays out the qualifications for elders, uh, very similar to um, and identical to the passage in Timothy, but we see a distinction um, in a few places that we're not, we won't take the time to get into here, but the, the basics are the same, that God's grace is that which transforms and that the gospel must be kept the center and central to all that we do and say. And so he talks about appointing elders in his outline, uh, putting things in a godly order, guarding against false teachers and ethical instructions without within the church, as well as eth ethical instructions for the church within the world. And then Paul's final words to Titus. And then there's the letter to Philemon. Um, Philemon is uh, one of Paul's personal letters. It's not one of the pastoral epistles. Timothy and Titus were the pastoral epistles. The other epistles were written to church groups. Philemon was written to an individual, and uh, we'll see the purpose here. But as it states there, it's to appeal for Onesimus, who was a runaway slave from Philemon. And uh, it really carries a great message of the gospel and redemption and restoration. And that's what Paul is calling for in this letter. Um, the key themes are the fact that all of our relationships should be changed by the gospel. Uh, when we're impacted by the gospel personally, it should change the way we look at everyone and the way we relate to every other person. And that through the gospel, we know God's forgiveness. Um, therefore, the gospel changes the way I respond to any and everyone, even those who might do me wrong. Um, that because I know the forgiveness of God, I'm, I now look through that lens as I see others, and especially others who have done me wrong, just as I've been forgiven the wrong that I've done against God. And then that the, the ultimate motivation is that grace, that grace that comes as a result of the gospel. And so in Philemon, we see this outline of Paul's greeting, as is normal uh, with his letter. We see Paul sharing uh, the thanksgiving. Um, again, that's, that's not unusual for the apostle Paul. But then we see his plea for Onesimus, Onesimus being the runaway slave, and um, Paul talking about sending Onesimus back and introducing him as, as the one who had left. But the value of now uh, the freedom that he has in Christ and picturing that in the forgiveness and freedom that can be granted because of what he has received in Christ. And then Philemon's reception of Onesimus and that um, Paul as one to whom Philemon owed his life in the sense that uh, Paul expressed the gospel of grace to him, that he came to know that freedom in Christ and relationship to God, that uh, Paul became, uh, as he says, uh, or as he illustrates, kind of a co-signer on the loan to pay any debts that Onesimus owes 
because of Paul's bringing the gospel to Philemon. Um, but then Paul also as the guest of Philemon and, and final greetings. It's a short one chapter book, but it contains so much of grace. And, and not that the gospel is ever to be taken advantage of, but that um, Paul bases his appeal to Philemon on the fact and the life-changing fact of God's grace that the gospel brings. And so um, it's, it's uh, not just a general sense of caring for people, but the specific relationship that they had in Paul's connection uh, to Philemon. And so we see that spelled out here. And, and again, that we would be those who would live lives and see others differently because of the gospel's impact on us. Again, I am grateful for this opportunity to facilitate um, your experience through uh, this overview of the Bible. And uh, I trust that, again, want to encourage you that you keep up with your reading and your weekly assignments. And I look forward to being with you again and as always. And I hope you catch this and the seriousness of which I speak, that you will be quick to contact me if there's any way that I can be of help to you in this class or even personally. Um, I want to uh, be here for you and help you uh, not only in this class, but in any life-related issue in regards to uh, the truth of God's Word. So I trust God's blessing upon you. Look forward to uh, being with you again in the future. God bless you.